Well, thankful again for this time together. Grateful for some who are back that uh, have been sick and thankful for the fact that uh, we are all able to be out, some in the parking lot, but uh, glad in whatever way to be together and missing, missing some of our number. I want to start the lesson this morning in Ephesians chapter 6. In Ephesians 6 and in verse 1, children obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest live long on the earth. Uh, this is a requested lesson, by the way. I'm trying to work through the request of those that uh, have offered suggestions, and I always appreciate them. And I think this is a passage that ought not to be overlooked. It has a word to say, especially to our young people. So I ask the special attention of our young people. Uh, children, obey your parents. Children, honor your parents. It's interesting to me, sometimes in looking at a passage like Ephesians 5 and 6, that has a lot to say about the responsibility of husbands and of wives in particular, and something to do with fathers, that the responsibility of children can be lost in that picture. You know, we think of kids sometimes as just along for the ride. Actually, that's not so. There's a, another familiar passage uh, we have uh, uh, made into a song. It was originally a song, a psalm, Psalm 148. And uh, we have, uh, through the years, uh, sung a version of this psalm, Praise Ye the Lord. He begins there in Psalm 148. Praise ye the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise ye him, all his hosts. Praise ye him, sun and moon, and all ye stars of light, ye heaven of heavens, and ye waters that are above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. He hath also established them forever and ever, and his decree will not pass. Verse 7, Praise ye the Lord from the earth, ye dragons, and all ye deeps, fire and hail and snow and vapor and stormy winds, mountains and hills and fruitful trees and cedars and beasts and cattle and creeping thing and fowl, and we get to read that pretty soon. We wonder, what in the world is he talking about? He's talking about the, the not just the angels. I get that part. But the sun and the moon, praise God. And he calls on the, uh, these uh, great sea beasts, whatever they were, the dragons, the tain, and the snow, and the mountains, and the hill. Well, the point of the psalm, I think, is not that difficult, is it? He's saying that everything that God made has a place in his plan. Isn't that right? Everything that God made has a place in his plan. And he calls on all of those things to do what they were made to do. If the mountains are there to show glory, if the stars are there to give, and the sun and the moon to give the uh, sign days and months and years, if the angels are given charge over his people, let them do what they were commanded to do because he commanded them and they are called on to fulfill his word in verse 8. And by the way, among those called on, verse 12 are both old, young men and maidens, old men and children. I think the, that this great old psalm reminds us of the fact that everybody has a place, even children in the plan of God. And so I want to think with you a little bit about children in the plan of God and the responsibility that God places on them. And I think the passage we began with makes it plain what their main job is. That the main job of children is to honor their parents. To me, always the idea of to consider something to be precious, something to be valuable, uh, something to be revered, uh, it's the word that's used, by the way, of people in, uh, in Acts 28 
he's not talking about Paul being the father of those uh, on the uh, island they were cast upon after their shipwreck. But you know, when, when Paul found his way there to Malta, the chief man of the island was a guy named Publius. And um, his uh, father was sick and in bed, suffering from a fever and dysentery, which was usually fatal, frankly. You dehydrate, you die. But Paul went to him and prayed and placed his hand on him and made him well. And I tell you, that changed everything. They greeted them pretty kindly to start with. After that, Paul was revered. He was honored. Same word used here in Ephesians. In fact, it says they show great respect for us in many ways. You know, that's what God wants you to do as a child. He wants to show many, in many ways, respect and honor for your parents. Listen to me now. Respect and honor for your parents. In what ways should a child show respect and honor for those who are their parents? By the way, I think it extends beyond childhood, beyond uh, our young years. I want to mention four this morning in the brief time that we have. In the first place, an obvious one, you know how children honor their parents? They honor by obeying them. They honor them by yielding their will to their parents. Back to our text, children obey your parents. That's where it's found right there. To obey literally is to listen under. That's what the word means. Uh, as if you've got a hierarchy or an order and someone above gives the order to me and I'm below them. So I will honor their <coughs> demand, their request <coughs> to hear as a subordinate, to listen attentively by application to heed, to conform to a command or authority. You know, the subject of authority is not new to us as Christians. When I look in a passage like uh, Luke 7, and this is not told about uh, children and their parents, but it's talking about authority, same idea. And there was a soldier that Jesus encountered. He needed healing uh, for his servant. And he called upon Jesus to help him. But he said, there's no need for you to come to my house. He said, I know you can speak the word. That'll be enough. It's a great passage. In verse 8 of Luke 7, <coughs> it's the soldier who says to Jesus, <coughs> As you know, I'm in a chain of command. And I have soldiers at my command. And I tell one, go, and he goes. To another, come, and he comes. And I tell him, I serve do this, and he does it. That's what it means to be in a chain of command. And here's somebody giving the instruction, and here's somebody else who obeys it. There is no substitute for obedience. That's something we learn from our relationship with God. It wasn't that long ago we were talking about that passage in 1 Samuel 15, where well, Saul had to learn the lesson that God doesn't want us to come up with all kind of great ideas that are different from his command. To obey is better. Let me say to you as young people, there's no greater way to honor your parents than to do what they say. To take direction, to recognize my role is not above them, but it's beneath them. There's a chain of command given by God. Obey. Simple enough. Harder to put into practice. In John the 8th chapter, in verse 28, Jesus is explaining that the reason why his enemies among the Jewish leadership just didn't really understand him is we're from two different fathers. Your father's the devil. My father's from above, and I'm his true son. Now, God set up the family to teach us something about our relationship with him, didn't he? And here's one point that he made. He said, one thing you're going to learn from right now, from the beginning all the way to the end of my life here on earth, is my dedicated obedience to my father. When you've lifted up the son of man, I think talking about the crucifixion, isn't that the ultimate example of obedience? Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. He said, you will then know that I do nothing of my own authority. Just 
says the Father has taught me, I speak. And he who sent me is with me. He's not left me alone. For I always do think all things that are pleasing to him. Everything I do is pleasing to him. That's my existence. <laughs> That's my work to please my Father. You're looking for what it means to obey God? Look at the Lord. Look at his life. He teaches us what a son is. Now, there is a caveat to that. There is a condition to that. Obey your parents in the Lord. And talking about this verse through the years, I, I've made the points. People interpret that different ways. But I, I don't think when he says here in the Lord, he means as a Christian. Or that your parents have to be Christians to obey them. I, I think what he means is within the realm of what's right, within the realm of what the Lord allows. Obey your parents in the Lord. Within that broad realm, do everything that they say. That's, that's Colossians 3. Children, obey your parents in everything. It pleases the Lord. If it pleases the Lord, obey. Uh, and here's an important point. We all know this to be true. It's my job as a parent to teach my children obedience because if I don't do it, if I don't teach my children while they are young and in, in my control, that they don't run the world. And everything doesn't have to be okayed with them or their times. They're just going to have to do what they're told, even if they don't like it, even if they haven't been consulted and agree with it. And I'll tell you, when they get out of my household, somebody else is going to teach them that lesson. Or well, they'll learn it somewhere worse than uh, my house, for sure. So better that they learn that lesson from me, from the one that loves them most of all, that there are times in life we have to learn we don't rank above. We are below. And we're the ones who are told what to do. And let me ask our young people, don't answer out loud. How you doing with that, by the way? Will that be true about you? That you obey without Murmuring without complaining and without objecting and without having to have a word about it and without sneaking around doing what you want to do anyway? These are the questions that I think that our good people, we have good young people here, good young people have to ask themselves. Am I submissive as I should be? Uh, let me suggest another way we honor parents, obeying them obviously. But secondly, by respecting them. I think it's possible to do what somebody says and not respect them. You see that at work, don't you? You work secular work. And there are times when you may, God said, come in, i got to come in. I don't like it, and I let everybody know I don't like it. I let everybody know what I think of him. Well, that's obedience, but not really respect. If you look at one of the modern speech translations of Romans 1.30, he's describing the darkness of the world. He says, the world will become less and less like God would have it to be. People saying cruel things about others. They hate God. They're proud, they're conceited, they're boastful, always thinking up new ways to do evil. These people don't respect their parents. It may seem like a strange uh, addition to the list, but of course it's not, is it? Because that's where all the other problems start. I don't learn to obey parents, so I don't learn to obey God. Action needs to be accompanied by the attitude of submission. And I think that the old story of the prodigal son is a great example of that. We'll not read it in its fullness. Let me just remind us of a couple of points there, the introduction to that story, the opening of that story. In Luke chapter 15, Jesus is talking here about lost things. He tells a great story about Two sons that were lost in different ways. But uh, in verse 11, a certain man had two sons. And uh, the younger of them said to his father, Father, verse 12, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he did. He took his inheritance and just left. Not many days after, the younger son gathered all that he had, took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. Don't you suppose he left because he wouldn't have been allowed to have uh, 
engage in that riotous living at home. But that's what he wanted and that's what he did. And people do what they want to most of the time, don't they? Well, people make the choice that they want most of the time. You can't make people. I I've known folks uh, that had problems, drug problems, problems like that. They get clean from it, they go back to it. And they do that again and again. And you can take folks like that and put them out in the middle of a, of a, of a Kansas wheat field somewhere where they don't know anybody and it won't take long, if they want to, they'll find a way to go back to evil. You know why? Because that's what they want to do. They're just hooked on it, they're bent on it, and their will is too weak and they're... They, there's a way to find the wrong door. And there's a way to do right. This young man, after he spent all that he had, you remember, verse 14, he arose... Uh, when the famine came into the land and suddenly there was nothing to eat and nowhere to turn. He had uh, tried to uh, work uh, feeding hogs and that didn't uh, even get him fed. So he came to himself and he said in verse 17, how many hired servants of my father have bread enough to spare and I'm dying of hunger. I'll rise and I'll go to my father and I'll say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Now, that was an important moment in his life. Uh, and it was something that he needed to know and it's something every one of us needs to know. You know, while he was at home, I, I, I think his attitude stunk and I think his desires were obviously somewhere else. But as far as I know, his conduct was clean. As far as I know, as far as the text tells us in this story, it wasn't as if he was engaged in all kind of immorality while he was home. Well, when he came back, he certainly seems to have been clean in his behavior from then on. So what's the difference? Everything's the difference. In, in both cases, he might have been following the rules, but in the first case, he was chafing under it, could not wait to get out of here while I do what I want to do. In the second case, he had respect for his father, and he had learned a lot about himself. It's not just the rule, it's the attitude. It's not just the outward obedience, it's that inward submission and respect that matters. That's the dif The difference was his attitude, and that had changed absolutely. One thing he had come to realize was his father wasn't as out of as he thought he was. He thought, my father just doesn't get it. I'm going to get out here and live. This guy doesn't know how to live. He found out he was the one who didn't know what life was about. Now, the second place... He certainly came to realize, I love the words here, I am no more worthy. That's right, you're not worthy. And in one sense, we, we are not worthy. We don't deserve all that our parents do for us. There's a fact about parenting that we've all heard. Uh, some people say, I'll tell you the thing about parenting. The pay's lousy and the hours are terrible. And the work's dirty. Every parent in this room knows that's so in, in one sense. We don't resent the word. But the fact is, it's a hard job. It's a very hard job. And, and only mature children you know, really appreciate the sacrifice that their parents make. Time and money and the spirit and the heart. And maybe it's not until we have our own children that we come to realize I've heard my mama say this many times through the years. She used to say, you, you don't know what worry is till you have children. I don't know if that might be an indictment on me now that I think about it. But, um, you know, I know exactly what she meant. You know, you think you know what worry and concern and anxiety is. I don't mean in, in a sinful way. I don't mean in a faithless way. But, but if you allow me to use that word, worry, Everybody that's a parent in this room knows. That's a whole other level of concern. Your kids are on the road. Your kids are away from you. Your kids get sick. Your kids, and you want them to be well, and you want them to make good decisions, and you want them to. And how many children, I mean, it's a great mark of maturity when a child comes to realize, you know, my parents are concerned about me. And I need to make sure that I make that as, as, uh, as light on their mind as possible by making good choices and being communicative. 
because it's not all about me. And I owe those folks. Fact is that just because I say, well, I didn't ask to be born, doesn't really make parenting any easier on my parents. And it doesn't make my job to be respectful any less. Uh, how do we show respect for our parents or disrespect for our parents? Let me offer a couple of specifics here quickly. Obviously, the way we talk to our parents matters. You know, we can't read this verse enough. In 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 1, I want everybody, every young person in particular, but all of us, to think about these words. Listen to what Paul wrote. Never use harsh words when you correct an older man. But talk to him as if he were your father. Talk to younger men as if they were your brothers. Older women as if they were your mothers. He didn't say, don't correct somebody who's old. What he did say was, you talk to them like you talk to your father. And you talk to your father very carefully. Very carefully. And your mother very carefully. It's not a credit to a young man or a young woman when he hollers at his parents like they are some raccoon running around his garbage can. That's not the way we talk to older people. That's not the way we talk to our parents. And if, if the young people here, if we find ourselves speaking harshly or sharply or in an aggravated fashion toward our parents, let me tell you, we, we're not pleasing God in that. Something's got to change. And when our parents come down hard on us about that, they're doing us a favor. Because that's something that needs to be corrected now. The way we talk about our parents can also be a part of this. Showing respect, showing disrespect. You know, it's a little bit like to me a man, you work secular work, you work with a bunch of guys. Um, here's what I found to be true. There'd always be some guy in the break room who made it his um, practice to run down his wife before everybody else, talk about what a spendthrift she was or how dumb she was or how aggravating she was or how selfish she was or how this or that she was. And uh, people like that, I, I don't know if they ever realize just how they demean themselves when they do that, how small they make themselves look. This is your spouse. This is the woman you promised to love, honor, and cherish. This is the woman that is yours, and you talk about her this way. You do yourself a great disservice when you do that. And we certainly don't do God right when we do that. The Lord doesn't want that. If there are problems, let them be worked out. And by the way, I'm not saying that there may not be problems. We may not need to get help sometimes. I may need to say, hey, I need some help. That's not, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about, we all know what I'm talking about, that, that habit of just grumbling and griping and uh, mocking, this is, this is not right. And it's not right when we as children uh, get in among other people, so-called friends, and run down our parents. Maybe they start it, we'll join in with them. This is not godly behavior. Not appropriate, not right. We ought to show them consideration. Not, not only should we not be disrespectful in our language, we ought to in every way show deference to our parents. That great passage from the Old Testament comes to mind. In Leviticus 19, it was serious, wasn't it, in the old law? If you had a child and they were just a consistently rebellious child of their parents, that was a capital offense. On the other hand, he says... Teach your children and let children take into their own heart this lesson. Respect for age. You shall stand up before the gray head and honor the face of an old man and you shall fear the Lord I am. Fear your God I am the Lord. You know, courtesy and politeness and deference to age, especially to our parents. That's characteristic of people who have a godly attitude. That's how you honor father and mother. Parents are the ones who have our best interest at heart. And, and it's so sad that there's so many young people too immature to realize that. 
that rebellion is a self-destructive act. What was it that Proverbs 30, in the words there of Agur, the eye that mocks a father and scorns to obey a mother will be picked out by the ravens and eaten by the vultures. You know, you're setting yourself up for a great deal of destruction, of, 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 of sad times and hard times. Destruction cuts your life short, the wise man said, when you fail to uh, respect your parents, when you fail to learn from your parents. That's another point we'd like to make. We'll just make these last two quickly, but it is important. You know, our parents are not always right. Uh, and, and sometimes they can seem so backwards. You know, they just don't get the technology like we do, or they, in many cases at least, they don't know about the new technology. And uh, they, they don't dress like they dress now, and they don't know all of the uh, nomenclature and all of the new words and all the new phrases, and so uh, they don't know any of the music that's played, and so they're just dumb. <laughs> and, you know, and, and again, it takes a bit of maturity for a young person to realize that that's the way it works in every, that, that's going to be true about you one day, by the way, too, if you live long enough and if you have children. This is the way it works. You know, time goes on and young people are fascinated by this, and older people may not be up on all those things, but that hardly means that they're behind in life because they know a great deal. They know how to work and make a living. And if we had time, we'd go back over here and look at these passages that, that warn us against laziness and against a, a lack of initiative. And children do their parents, I'm sorry, parents do their children a great deal of good when they teach them that work ethic and that teach them that sense of responsibility. Don't look at your parents as if they're stupid. They're a lot further along in this world than, than we are. And there are a lot of things we can learn from them about how to work and how to live and how to get along and how uh, to, uh, to run a family. They know a lot about the temptations of this world, more than we do. When you look back again at the Proverbs and you see the picture of the young foolish individual in chapter 6 and chapter 7. Uh, one point that uh, could be made about that is, you know, Solomon, he could see the trouble coming. He could see that young man going down to the house of that woman whose husband's not at home. Bad idea. Everything about it's bad. No way good can come of this. But young people don't either understand the temptations or they don't uh, care enough about the consequences. And so when your parents tell you you can't go with that crowd or you're going to have to be not alone or you can't go to this place, these are lessons that they teach you not because they don't love you but because they want to protect you. And they want to help you to be pure and to, do think, to, to abstain from things that will cause regrets. Honoring your parents means you have enough sense to learn from them and to recognize their superior experience. They're a better judge of character in many cases than, than young people. <laughs> that may not be true every time, but it's true a lot of times. And so the wise man back in Proverbs chapter 2, um, you know, he can tell you that there is a man that you ought to stay away from and there's a woman you ought to stay away from. Uh, when wisdom enters into that heart, and knowledge is pleasure to thy soul. Discretion will preserve you. And understanding will keep you. To deliver you from the way of the evil man. The man that speaks forward things. Verse 16. To deliver you from the strange woman. Even from the stranger which flatters with her words. The Proverbs are set up that way, aren't they? It's just this picture of my son, listen. The parent, as it were, teaching their beloved child, problems, things to avoid. I've been there. I know what you don't know because you hadn't been down this road before. Listen and learn from their experience. Proverbs 23 and verse 22 says, listen to the Father who gave you life. Good point. And finally, you know, care for parents. That's also involved in honoring them. The Lord made that point in, in Mark chapter 7. 
he said about his enemies. They want to know why Jesus didn't wash his hands like the elders' tradition. He said, I tell you, you got a lot of nerve talking about tradition. Uh, I, you are really good at rejecting the word of God and hanging on to your tradition. And then he gives the example, you remember, of how that you all have got a system set up where a guy does not even have to help his parents who are in need. And he'd go home and feel good about that. That's devilish, he said. You know, the Lord expects us in honoring our parents to not just to obey them as children, but to care for them when maybe they are more like children and need help. Or maybe some circumstances reduce them such that they cannot provide for themselves. Children or grandchildren of a widow must first learn to respect their own family by repaying their parents. 1 Timothy 5 and verse 4. In verse 8 of the same chapter, if anyone doesn't take care of his own, especially his immediate family, he's denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. God gave parents to care for children. And then in some sense, God gave children to care for parents. And, and it's up to, to both groups to make the best of their opportunities as uh, they come forward. And I'll tell you something you already know. He didn't say do that because it's convenient. Because parenting is not convenient. Hardly ever convenient. Nor is taking care of your parents, if they're in that situation, often convenient. And it may not even always be deserved in the latter case. But, but the people that I know that do that, they do it just because it's right. They will not let their parents suffer or lack because it's just not right to do anything but honor their parents. So... Let me conclude by asking a couple of questions. Number one, or make a couple of points, I should say. Number one, how you treat your parents affects your lifespan. It affects your quality of life. And you need to think about that as a young person, that if I become a rebel against good advice, it's going to cause a lot of headaches. When you beat your head against the wall, it tends to hurt your head more than the wall. How you treat your parents affect your relationship with God. There's no doubt about that and the eternal consequences. Let me ask you, are you honoring your parents today? Well, for some of us, too late. It's a limited opportunity. So while you have the opportunity, and especially I'm talking to those while you're at home, make sure that you honor your parents, that you make good memories, that you make their job as easy as possible because they deserve that, but most important because God demands it. And if we haven't, if, if I'm here in this audience and I'm thinking about ways in which I really have not been as respectful and as careful and, and as uh, godly as I should have been, Make it right. I claim to be all grown up. Okay, what grown up people do when they make a mistake, they make it right. Make it right. And then do better. And the Lord will help us in that regard. Okay, thank you for your kind attention this morning. If you're here as one who is not a child of God, why not come to the loving Father, the heavenly Father, the eternal Father, become his child, and find uh, all the guidance that uh, we need in this life to be with him for eternity. If you're here in need of being baptized into Christ, why not today make that start? If you're here as one who has a child of God, has not been faithful to the Lord, not careful for him, then let us know if we can help you to return to him. And uh, we'd ask you to do that right now as Dad leads us in song. Will you come?